Hey so guys, my name is Chano. Welcome to the Code Review Series, a series in which I take a look at the code that you send me. Over the last few episodes, we have been looking at a 2D game engine that took the author 2,000 hours to make. We have uncovered some problems with it that I have talked about over these last few videos, and it even led to me making a video about how to properly set up C++ projects, which you can find up there. I think we are coming to a close with this project. In fact, I was actually going to choose a new project for this episode, but then I realized there's actually like there is quite a lot of code here. In fact, let's start by actually seeing how much code there is here. So over here in the source directory, let's just run this clock program to measure the lines of code. 242 files and 48,000 lines of code. So that's, that's quite a bit of code. And specifically just having a browse through all of this, because like, yeah, there's quite a lot of stuff to be discovered here. That's why like, I mean, people have been saying that 2000 hours like this doesn't look like a project that has had 2000 hours of work poured into it because the stuff that we've looked at you know has not been the, the the best code and the best design but the thing is the amount of time that you work on a project has nothing to do with the quality of that project and the level i guess of quality of that project an experienced programmer who knows exactly how to build a 2d game engine might take a few hundred hours and build something far superior to this. But then someone who's just a beginner and just learning all about game engines can just enjoy the process of building this game engine. And if they work on it for, you know, in this case, over 2000 hours, like you are physically gonna end up with a large program, a large project, a lot of code. But if you spend all of your time just programming and not learning, then the product you make is probably not going to be very good, even though it is physically large and it might have a lot of features, which is what we're seeing here. Now, this might sound discouraging, but I, I don't want this to be discouraging because this actually reminds me of something that I used to do back in the day. I don't know if you asked for a story, but you're getting a story right now. So when I first started programming, I distinctly remember that in year 12, this is the final year of high school here in Australia, I was sitting in my English class with my laptop and to have a bit of fun, I thought that I would basically work on a game. Now at this point in my life, I had probably around a year worth of programming experience. I only knew Java and I really only knew how to make games from scratch kind of in Java. So over the course of the semester, when I had a little bit of spare time in that English class, me and my friend who was sitting next to me, we would kind of work on this game. He didn't know any programming, so I'd be writing all the code, but together we would be coming up with like, you know, what features I should add. And because I had this friend sitting next to me, I made a game that we could both play like on one computer, just on one keyboard. And it was a game called Squared, which I actually ended up remaking later for a game jam. But the game is basically, there are two squares. One of them has to tag the other ones who just chase each other around like a fixed screen. And so because this was just really about having a bit of fun playing this game and being able to program in new features, I didn't really spend much time researching anything other than probably like Java API things. Whatever feature we would come up with, I would just try and find a solution for it on the spot without really trying to like learn the proper way to do it. And the code was really, really bad. I mean, maybe maybe we could code review that for fun one day. Young Cherno code is always terrible. But anyway, the point of this story is that even though the code did not turn out very good and I would completely write it in a different way even a year after that because I learned so much more stuff, it was still, I think, a very valuable experience for me to sit down and actually use my brain to try and work out solutions to problems without knowing that what I was doing was objectively terrible. Because what it did is it made me think. And then later I was able to see why those solutions were not very good and why there are certain better solutions because I could experience that firsthand instead of just being told, don't do that, that's bad. For whatever reason, do, do it this way instead. However, if you're gonna spend 2000 hours on writing a 2D game engine, I would definitely recommend that you balance that with learning and education which basically means pick up a book. For example, Game Engine Architecture by Jason Gregory. That's a really good one. Look at some existing projects on GitHub to see how they structure things. Read some articles to see what a potential good way to structure an entity component system might be. This project specifically is using SFML. So maybe look at some example SFML games or documentation to see what a good way to use that library would be. Or if you're at the beginning of your programming journey, then why not check out Brilliant.org, the sponsor of this video for free. Brilliant.org is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. It's an excellent way to dive into programming for the first time because they have some really good beginner level computer science courses that will help you think like a programmer. And because I believe that programming and math 
are really, really important together. Brilliant is an amazing choice because they also have a lot of really good math courses. Now, why Brilliant specifically? Because their courses are super engaging and interactive. They have these widgets you can play with to see how things work. Like for example, in their calculus course. Calculus can be pretty hard, but being able to visually see how numbers change things can be really, really helpful. And did I mention that you'll also get quizzed to make sure that you're learning and retaining this information? Now, if calculus is too advanced for you, don't worry because Brilliant's math courses go all the way down to their everyday math course, which is a fantastic gentle introduction into the world of math. And you can get started for free. They have a 30 day free trial that you can use to check out all of the courses on their platform and see if you like them. And if you do, Brilliant have been nice enough to offer the first 200 subscribers 20% off an annual membership. Huge thank you to brilliant.org as always for sponsoring this video. So yeah, if you're gonna invest a lot of time into a project, don't forget to also invest time in education and learning. So today I wanted to take a look at the entity component system uh, because there seems to be some sort of entity component system inside this engine. I don't think it's exactly set up you know, to be an actual entity component system. That might sound confusing. What I mean is that just because you have a class called component and you have entities does not mean you've created an entity component system. An ECS, an entity component system or an ECS for short is a specific type of kind of data structure and system. And the benefit of an ECS, or at least the two kind of major major features that I think are important for it to be an ECS are the compositional functionality, meaning you can create an entity and then compose its functionality by just adding in whatever components you want arbitrarily and they all just work together. But then also the performance, because what you're doing is you're batching together operations that are required to happen for components and you're storing components usually contiguously in memory so that even though we visually see different entities doing different things, Things, when it comes to the computer processing those entities, it doesn't worry about them being actual entities and then having to traverse whatever components they have. It specifically bulk batch kind of processes the components all in a row together, which is what makes it so fast. So that's basically my checklist when I'm looking at whether or not this is a correct implementation of an entity component system. Now, isn't ECS the absolute best solution for all cases? No, there is no best solution for all cases. There are definitely things that are better in probably 99% of cases, which is why we consider them to be superior solutions to certain problems in computer science. But to be honest, like computers are so complicated and just requirements are so different. Like your requirement might be so simple that any solution fits the bill and some solutions might be easier to extend or easier to understand for more junior developers, which might make them the superior solution, even though they might perform 10% worse because 10% of a few microseconds might not be significant. All right, anyway, so we have this class called component. This is like our base class. We have a couple of virtual functions. So immediately this tells me that of course this is going to be derived from. Yeah, so I mean, to me this like already shows a little bit of a problematic behavior for an ACS, because if you have derived classes, you can't exactly store them as components and still have contiguous memory. That's usually not what you would do anyway. With different components, usually what we do is we have buckets. So you might have like a sprite component, you might have a transform component. And then the idea is within those buckets, we allocate memory and we just store these components all in a row. And that way, like let's just say we have a transform component and it's a four by four matrix. That might be 64 bytes of memory, right? So if you have 64 bytes of memory, one after the other, and they are really truly contiguous, the benefit there is that if I need to access all of these because I'm iterating through all the transform components in my scene because I wanna do some rendering or whatnot, this, this obviously gets a little bit more complicated because if you're gonna do rendering, you also need sprite components. Does the entity have a sprite component? Maybe it's an audio thing. It has a transform, but not a sprite component. Anyway, of course this gets more complicated, but I'm just trying to keep things simple here. If we have all of these, then when we ask for this first one, our CPU will prefetch a bunch of memory. That's gonna be more hot on our CPU cache. And it means that it's, it's kind of like we don't have to request the memory for each transform component. We kind of batch it together. It's like if you were shipping something from one country to another, if it's all coming from the same warehouse and in fact the boxes are next to each other, they can just package that into, let's just say one big box, ship it to you, you get everything all at once. It's obviously much more efficient than if they're coming from three different warehouses and you have to send them all independently. That's basically what you're doing when you're creating contiguous memory that you can fetch all at once instead of having it all be segregated in different parts of your physical RAM. Now, if you have components and they're virtual classes, basically, so you have this base class called component, and then you have all of these derived classes that you create for 
sprite component, transform component, you know, audio component, whatever you might have, then obviously the only way that you can store them in a contiguous block of memory is by creating pointers out of them. And so you have a pointer to an instance of a derived class, which then of course will live in heap memory somewhere in a arbitrary location that will not be contiguous. Now, some more words here just to dive a little bit deeper into this. I said heap allocation here because, I mean, I, I've seen in this project, I don't think there are custom allocators. I think this person is just using the new keyword and it's not like overridden with a custom allocator or anything. They're just using the standard stock standard C++ new keyword to allocate memory, in which case it will come from an arbitrary place. If they were using a custom allocator in an arena, technically maybe this memory might be a bit more together and a bit more contiguous, but we're not gonna talk about that. The other possibility is that you don't technically have to heap allocate derived classes. You can just stack allocate them. Now, the reason why that's uncommon is for a couple of reasons, but the main reason in this case would be they'd all be different sizes. So this transform component might be 64 bytes plus, you know, these one byte booleans. So you might have 66 bytes, but then because there are virtual functions that also be a V table. So you have that size, but then a sprite component might have different members. Therefore it will be a completely different size. So because these aren't all the same size, you'd need to store the size for each of these, which can be done. I mean, this is C++, this is programming. We could do whatever we want. We could have a table of integers or of, you know, UN64Ts that were sizes or really offsets of each component within this list. This is probably a little bit confusing, but at that point, what you're doing is instead of this just being like a traditional vector of memory where you have like each element is a fixed size, they're all uniformly sized. You're kind of turning it into just a buffer of contiguous memory and then you're serializing it basically. And then you have different offsets for different elements. Anyway, I don't know why I'm, sometimes I just get carried away. So pulling out of the depth now and going back to my simple explanation in the beginning, that's why having like a polymorphic, you know, derived class, like a, a, this hierarchy of classes for component, generally not a good idea. And why traditional anti-component systems probably, I mean, not that I've, you know, read all of them, but in my experience, they would usually just not not do that. And as an example, if we take a look at Hazel and its components, you can see that they're just like struct mesh component, that's it. Struct animation component, that's it. It's not derived from anywhere. It's just an independent struct of data. That's that's all it is. So taking a look at an example, I mean, it looks like we have, yeah, so we have like this transform component and it's derived from component. I don't know why you have these namespaces everywhere if this is inside that namespace, but We'll ignore that. So the transform has a scale, a rotation, a uint32 rotation. I'm assuming that's probably degrees, but then you're also storing that as a as an integer. Interesting choice. Um, these, so these are private members. Then we have public, which position, texture size, next position, last position, position parent. This is a lot of stuff for a transform component. Now, what I'm interested in at this stage um, is just basically how, so there's, there's an init function. And then inside the init function, we reset it, which will... I mean, here's the constructor. So the constructor will do a bunch of stuff, but then reset will also just, yeah, set all of these things and attach sprite. And it's a sprite pointer. Wow. So, wow. So, so transforms have a sprite pointer in them. So sprite in this engine is kind of like entity because there is no entity. And because this is called sprite engine and it's the 2D engine, the sprites are the entities. And I don't know if that extends to entities that don't get rendered. So for example, like an audio listener or some kind of physics bounding box that might not have a visual rendered representation, whether or not that's also considered a sprite or not. But as far as I'm aware, sprite is the same as entity in this in this engine. So it's got a reference to that, which is a little bit weird. That's not something that you would typically do. What I am interested in though, is where does this live? Let's see if we can find where there's a lot of transform stuff here. Let's find maybe like, is this a component? Yes. Let's just try and find this because transform is such a common thing. Maybe this is less common. Okay. This animated equals anime. Okay. It's inside sprite. So there's sprite.cpp and sprite.h. And so this is the sprite class. So this is kind of like the entity class. Then we've got an ID. We've got a parent ID. We've got a, right, which is the SFML sprite. Okay. Oh, and then we've got all the components here as stack allocated. Oh man. Oh, oh boy. Oh, and then we've also got, well, we've also got this pointer to all the child. So we've got all the children as pointers here, as well as the parents. But then remember how in a previous episode, we also looked at Sprite repository, which also has a collection of sprites. And then, yeah, it's got a vector of sprites. 
which is really, I think, that's root level sprites because then we've got all of the all of the children and it's stored inside a tree, which is why, for example, this get all childs or get all children function will be recursive because it will keep having to traverse the tree since the ones stored inside sprite repository are just the high level ones. And that is why, again, we have we have to have a vector of all of the children here because the one in sprite repository is just the root level nodes, but these are all of the, the local relations or related sprites, I guess. I have talked about why this is not great and you don't wanna have a tree and you wanna have a flat list instead. And if you did have a flat list, I would also not have, you wouldn't have this hierarchy built inside of each sprite because then what you're doing is you're kind of duplicating your data across. You're, you should have a central place where you just stored the hierarchy and that's it. And Sprite shouldn't be aware of its hierarchy. If it needs to be, it asks whatever is storing the hierarchy, what are my children, instead of containing a copy, basically, of that children list itself. Because that's super annoying to maintain, if that makes sense. Like, you have to not only not only tell the data storage that stuff has changed, but then also tell each individual Sprite that their hierarchy has been updated. And that just gets messy, and it's also very bug-prone. But this I'm upset about. This I don't think. There's a lot of... There's a lot of things to say here. This is definitely not uh, any kind of ECS, any kind of anti-component system, at least not the traditional definition of what that is. The first problem with this really is a design kind of architecture problem. And that is the fact that a sprite automatically has these components and also you're storing them inside the sprite. Generally not what you wanna do because now if I want to, for example, render all of the sprites in my scene, what I have to do is I can't just get all of the like sprite renderer components and the transform components and whatever else I might need to render it and just kind of iterate through all of the ones that I have inside my scene and render them. I have to actually visit every sprite and then ask it, hey, do you have a sprite renderer? Yes, okay, I need to use that sprite renderer component now. That's not good because now I'm iterating through all the sprites and all of the data that's associated with it. So if I fetch a sprite, for example, here's what I'm trying to say. If I fetch a sprite, for example, I'm automatically fetching all of this data. Like there's a lot of stuff here that I'm automatically receiving, but I don't need half of it. And that's the benefit of the ECS. The fact that I'm going to get tunnel vision, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm only going to care about just this system, just what it needs. So this, the rendering needs the sprite render component, the transform, whatever else. I'm just going to focus on that because if I do that, it's just going to run faster. But with this, it's like you focus on the whole sprite because that's what you're doing. And then you have to fetch all of this stuff that you don't care about. Physics is not related to rendering, so why would I care about that? But yet I have to, because the sprite renderer is nestled in between all of these other systems that I don't care about. And that's really not good for design. That's why you would batch all of that data together and store different components in different buckets. You can also interleave components if you want with other ones, but that's besides the point. That's not what's happening here anyway. The other thing is all of them are automatically added. So an animator like this sprite might not have an animation, but it obviously has an animator component in some fashion. And then also these are not heap allocated. These are stack allocated. That's not the biggest problem here. Uh, it, you have to be careful with that because if you do have derived classes that are stack allocated, then if you do pass this into a function, for example, that takes just components, you might think that would work because you're downcasting it basically into its base class. But if it's stack allocated, that's gonna result in object slicing. Because when you do this, there's no information stored that basically tells it that no, 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 I actually am a sprite render component. It just casts you down to a component, which as we know, only has two booleans and that's it. And then you you kind of, you basically can't recover that data that you have inside transform. So all of this would basically be cut off and lost and sliced off. So that's called object slicing. And I recommend that you look that up as well if you want more information. So for that reason, I I probably wouldn't do that. It's not, it's not that you can't do that. It's just that you, you want to, you just need to be careful with that, that's all. But even if we ignore the performance problems of putting all of these into Sprite and then having to visit each Sprite to then get its components and send them to like a system, there's some systems here we can look at as well, maybe next time. But ignoring the performance things, I also just don't like the fact that they're all always present. <laughs> you know, like they're all here. When you create a Sprite, you automatically construct all of these objects. It kind of ruins the, the compositional attribute that I mentioned, like the fact that you can compose this with whatever you like, they're all already here. Uh, which I don't like. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. Leave your thoughts as well in the comment section below. Should I keep looking at this? Should I try and present some possible solutions to these problems? Let me know as well in the comment section below. Don't forget to check out Brilliant.org and I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.